Welcome to Challenging Climate, a podcast where we discuss the science, technology, and politics of climate change. I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy expert. And I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. Each episode, we bring on a guest with a unique perspective and deep expertise on climate change and put challenging questions to them. In this episode, we spoke with climate economist Richard Toll, who is a professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Sussex, as well as a professor of economics of climate change at Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam here in the Netherlands. He is the author of the textbook, Climate Economics, the Economic Analysis of Climate, Climate Change, and Climate Policy, which was recently published in its third edition. In this episode, we, well, Richard takes us on a whistle-stop tour of all of climate economics, covering some of the uncertainties, some of the challenges, a few of the technicalities, but very interesting stuff. And he also, we also discussed some of his concerns about the IPCC and his experiences there. And he ends on a very interesting set of thoughts on, on why he's optimistic about, about climate change and the future. Richard is the first climate economist we've had on Challenging Climate, and I think that that perspective is one that you will find valuable. So I encourage listeners to stay tuned for Richard Hope. Richard Toll is a professor at the Department of Economics University of Sussex, and the Professor of the Economics of Climate Change at the Institute for Environmental Studies and Department of Spatial Economics, Vrije Universiteit, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Welcome to Challenging Climate, Richard. Thanks for having me. We like to begin with a little bit about the personal history of our guests. How did you end up as a climate economist? <laughs> That's a long story, or maybe a short one, I don't know. I studied econometrics, which is actually, you, you can't do that in many countries. It is much more mathematics and statistics, computer science and economics. And I was actually pretty disappointed in economics when I graduated. So I had done a minor in environmental science during my studies, major in econometrics. And I used that really to get out of economics and do much more environmental science. So my first papers were really much more statistics and much more climate science than anything to do with economics. I was working in a place where there wasn't a lot of hard money. Most of it was uh, soft contract research. And they gave me this project that I was absolutely not interested in. They had essentially redoing uh, Bill Nordhaus's work, trying to do a cost-benefit analysis of climate change. My heart really wasn't in it. But as things go, the more you know about the subject, the more interesting it becomes. Uh, and of course, definitely around that time, there weren't that many people who were working on this. So you acquire a name and a reputation and people begin to ask you questions and begin to invite you for things and that sort of stuff. And I essentially never left, but it was not by choice uh, ever. <laughs> so what is climate economics? It's essentially the economics of climate change and the economics of climate policy. Uh, and nowadays also the economics of climate. So to start with the last one, there are big questions there. Obviously, if you look across the world, then what you see is that hotter places tend to be poorer and poorer places tend to be hotter. And the question is whether there is a causal relation there, whether there's reason to believe that Hot countries are poor because they're hot or because there is uh, some other factor that explains that. So that is one big question that overlaps with development economics and uh, with growth theory and all those things. Then there is the question about what are the impacts of climate change, economic activity and human welfare. There is also the question about what are the impacts of climate policy. If you reduce greenhouse gas emissions, what would it cost? but also questions about the design of climate policy. Suppose that a government uh, wants to reduce its emissions, how to best go about that. And then there's the questions about the architecture of international climate policy. How can we get countries to collaborate on greenhouse gas emission reduction? So those are sort of the big five questions of climate economics. Well, starting off with, I'm going to cover as your middle one, but 
how large will the impacts of climate change be on the economy? Rather, you know, what are those impacts and, and how large could they be? Well, people agree on what those impacts are, roughly. <laughs> and they are the same as if you would ask a biologist or a physicist or a chemist, right? Uh, so uh, the oldest ones, the, the one that people have been talking about most or the longest are the impacts on agriculture. Obviously, our food supply will change and that trickles down through the entire economy. Energy use will change. We use uh, energy to heat our homes during winter and to cool our homes during summer. We have sea level rise that either will take away productive resources such as agricultural land or will force us to invest money in dike building and the like. There are the various health impacts from infectious diseases such as malaria to things such as influenza that are cold related as well as heat stroke and all those things. That's a fairly standard list. People often forget about tourism and transport. Planes can't land if the air is too thin, right? And if it gets warmer, air gets thinner. There's all the road repairs from frost and those sort of things. Of course, our patterns, leisure time, as well as tourism, are to a large extent driven by weather and climate. We go to Florida, we go to uh, the Mediterranean because the weather is so nice there and dependably nice there. And that will change in the future. Also, the ability of the human body to do work strongly depends on the temperature. And if it gets too warm, particularly in humid climates, then the only thing you can do is just lie about and you can't do definitely hard physical labor is impossible. So there's this long list of impacts. And this, this is only a subset. The list is actually longer than this. And all of them have immediate consequences for the way we live our lives, but also for our economies. And then there's the things that do not affect the economy directly, but people care about such things as biodiversity loss and landscape change and all those things. There's no direct effect on the economy, but people do care about. So it should be included in the economic calculus. So coming to those economic calculations, maybe I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but in my understanding, there's maybe two ways to do this. There's a stock of capital that gets damaged in the model. And then there's a capacity for growth. How do these impacts play out within our economic models? And what are the different differences in those choices? Well, there's actually many more ways that it can affect an economy. So let's start with this, this, the economically simple one, right? The species goes extinct and we feel bad. It has a direct effect on our well-being, but does not affect our economic behavior. Definitely, if it's a species that does not otherwise interact with humans, right? So that is a simple one. Then you have such things as floods and storms. And essentially what they do is they damage the capital stock. That is, bridges are washed away, roads get damaged, buildings uh, may fall apart. So that affects our ability to make things and our ability to transport things. Other things are really shifts in demands. Uh, so if we are talking about sea level rise, then really what you see is that the most important effect there actually is the increased expenditure of dike building, which is what economists would call a defensive investment. That is dikes, capital stock, but they're actually not good for anything. They're just there to make sure that bad things don't happen. So you invest in capital, but that capital is essentially dead. So that takes away workers from other parts in the economy. It takes away capital, drives up interest rates, and so on and so forth. And then there's also things that are simply shifts in demand. So one thing that you see is in that in warmer places, people eat different things, lighter meals, and also they eat at different times, but that does not really affect the economy. And so you see that people start buying different things. It's not that they spend less, they just spend money on other things. I mean, fewer winter clothes, more summer clothes, or more pasta, and less sort of the heavy meals that you see in Northern Europe. So there is this whole range of different economic effects that you see. Tourism, I mentioned, essentially what you do as a tourist, and definitely as an international tourist, is that you take your income and you spend it abroad. So if in a warmer climate, people would shun uh, Greece because it gets too hot in summer and instead go to Germany, which also has a lovely coast, but not so lovely weather. But in the future, that will be different. And essentially what you see is that this expenditure shifts to a different place. So there's this, and that economists would call that an income transfer. 
rather in this case, a differential in income transfer. So there's all these different sort of economic effects that come into play. And then there's also, and that is something that you were hinting at, longer lasting effects. There is some evidence that heat makes us less intelligent. And definitely that is, the moment it's unclear whether this is incidental or structural, but definitely on hotter days, people tend to be less smart than on colder days. But it's not clear whether people in hotter climates less smart than people in colder climates. So it may be an adaptation, but we don't know how quickly people adapt. What we also see is that children don't learn very well during very hot days. And of course, if you have more exceptionally hot days, as we can expect in the future, that means that people will be less educated in the future. And the human capital stock or sort of the sum total of human knowledge and innovation, that is actually the main driver of economic growth. So we may also see these longer term effects pop up in the economy. And of course, all the other things that I talked about, I mean, if you're investing money in dikes, which are stupid things rather than in machinery, that also slows down economic growth, right? Because dikes don't add any production capacity to the economy. As, and that would then also have knock on effects in the longer run. So politicians often like to boil things down just to the one number of GDP. Yep. And on the global scale, how big a knock would, say, two and a half Celsius, roughly where we're heading in terms of global warming, it seems, how, how big an impact would that have on global GDP? And how does that compare to how much we expect global GDP to change? That number is actually, to most people, surprisingly small. If you look across the literature and you take the average of all the studies that have been published for two and a half degrees, then the answer at the moment is 1.7%. So climate two and a half degrees of warming would make the average person on the planet feel as if she had lost 1.7% 1 1 of her income. And I see at your face that that is a surprisingly low number. <laughs> It is a hugely uncertain number. There are 39 papers published on the subject, and they strongly disagree with each other. But the bulk of the evidence, and that is also what you find in all IPCC reports since the second one, and the first one did not have any estimates, but all IPCC reports since the second one have essentially said that it's somewhere between 0 and 2%. And that is actually a fairly small number. Now, of course, nobody would be happy if you take away 2% of their income, right? That, that is not something that we would like. So climate change is a problem. But at the same time, that is roughly the rate at which the world economy expands per capita, right? So two and a half degrees of warming, they're talking about 60, maybe 80 years of climate change is about as bad as losing one year of economic growth. Uh, that is the uh, fair comparison. To add two things. One, that number is hugely uncertain. That uncertainty is also skewed in the wrong way, in the sense that negative surprises are much more likely than positive surprises. So that is one thing I need to add there. And second, this number is the global average, and it's a dollar figure. So this is what happens if you add these dollar numbers across the world. And if you do that, then you look at economic geography, and then what you notice is that all the rich people are in the temperate spaces. Most of the income is there. So whenever you come up with a global total economic impact, you are essentially looking at what is going to happen in Japan and uh, Western Europe and North America, because that is where the dollars are. Uh, if you look at where the people are, you actually find much larger numbers because we also, the same studies show that the economic impacts of climate change are much larger in poorer countries than in richer countries. And there you're talking not about 2%, but more about 10 or 15%. And that is, of course, where the bulk of the people are. I'm going to pick up on that second qualifier on aggregate estimates of climate damages, that it excessively considers the interests of rich people because their contribution to global GDP is disproportionately great. And if climate change would have less effect and maybe even a beneficial effect at high latitudes, then you end up with a skewing that is arguably unjust or inequitable, depending on how one considers it. Can economists weigh the interests of people equally such that some sort of quasi-GDP figure considers the well-being of a poor person roughly equally with the well-being of a wealthy person? And if so, what's the outcome there? That is a fairly controversial subject. 
I actually come down on the side that we should and we must. And then you 2% that I mentioned before then easily become 6% or 8%, right? The core of the argument why you should do that, why you should not add dollars is actually a fairly intuitive one. And that is that a dollar is not the same to a rich woman as it is to a poor woman. If you take a dollar of Elon Musk, he would not notice. He happily uh, wasted, what is it, uh, $30 billion uh, on buying Twitter, right? But if you take a dollar from a farmer in the Central African Republic, that is a daily wage, right? Which is much more consequential. If you correct for the fact that the dollar is not worth the same to everybody, then you would use what economists call equity weights, and then you would weigh the impacts on poorer people much more strongly than you would on richer people. And calculations that have been done with this method suggest that then the impacts go up by a factor three or four, or maybe five, depending on the model and the exact estimates that go in. The argument against this, and the reason that it is so controversial in economics, is an argument that was made, I believe, most forcefully by Tom Schelling, a Nobel laureate, in the late 1970s. And that is that this is a silly way of spending money and setting priorities. So essentially what you do, and let's say we use these impact estimates to set a carbon tax, and then what you find is that if you use equity weights, then the carbon tax goes up quite dramatically. And that means that those people who are rich and use a lot of energy would pay a much higher carbon tax and a much larger share of their income towards uh, this carbon tax. That would be the policy implication of using uh, equity weights. Now, Schelling countered in a context that had nothing to do with climate change, that if you give these rich people the choice between paying a higher carbon tax or paying a lower carbon tax and transferring part of their income and compensating the poor people for the damage that they've done, then that is actually a cheaper solution for the rich because the poor are so poor that you can actually buy them off with very small bribe. And that is the argument that Schelling and the people who followed Schelling say, well, therefore, we should not be using these equity weights. We should not be compensating for income differences through our carbon tax or through how we calculate the total economic impact of climate change, but we should do it through income transfers. Now, theoretically, Schelling is absolutely right. Practically, we're not going to give large sums of money to the poor because they suffer from climate change. We're going to give them small amounts of money, but not large amounts of money. And therefore, I think we should correct our impact estimates. But that is controversial opinion. I, I can see why. There's an efficiency argument there behind what Schelling says. He implicitly says you have two objectives. And if your goal is to reduce greenhouse gas impacts, then you should tax carbon or whatnot. And if your goal is to redistribute income, then you should redistribute income. And trying to combine them has various problems. For example, there are wealthy people who emit less greenhouse gases, and there's poor people who, for whatever reason, emit relatively high, and that starts to create market distortions. A second often contested adjustment made to estimates of climate damages is that of time, that so much of climate change is about action now versus action later, benefits now versus benefits later. And this is typically accounted for in something called the discount rate. I understand that this doesn't manifest in damages that are calculated as a percent of GDP as a function of temperature, because that's somewhat independent of time. If it's 2.5 2 degrees warmer 10 years or 20 years, roughly all things being equal, then it'll have X percent impact on the economy. But it does come up in some contexts that we'll talk about more in a minute. Could you say a word about why we should and should not discount the future in our calculations? And maybe begin with a more simple question. How does one go about discounting the future? Yeah, these are excellent questions and controversial and very technical. So I think the intuition behind discounting is saving. So essentially what you do when you save money is you reduce your consumption now. Say you put $100 in the bank uh, today and in return you increase your consumption later. You put your $100 in the bank now and interest rates are 2-3%. So the bank gives you back $103 uh, next year. That is essentially saving. 
right? You make this comparison between consuming stuff now or consuming things later. And because you earn interest on your savings, essentially $100 today is not the same as receiving $100 today. It's not the same as receiving $100 next year or in 10 years, right? That is the intuition behind discount. And it is simply not the same. And this has nothing to do with inflation, right? And this has everything to do with there is a return on savings. There is a return on investment. The same is true for investing in greenhouse gas emission reduction. You put up money now to buy solar panels, to put insulation in your walls or in your loft. And in return, there's lower CO2. That means that you have a better climate in the future. And it is essentially an investment, right? And you should treat all investments in roughly the same way. And if an investment is identical, you should treat it in an identical way. So also for climate, we should discount the future. Now, the question then becomes how and by how much? And let's start with the how much. There are two arguments there that are diametrically opposed. The first argument goes back, at least in documented history, to Aristotle. And Aristotle said that it is immoral to levy interest. That is usury, and we should not be doing this. And this argument was picked up by two important people. One is St. Augustine, who brought it into uh, Catholic uh, doctrine. And the other was the prophet uh, Muhammad, who brought it into Islam. If you're a strict Catholic or if you're a Muslim, then you should not discount the future. Also, if you talk to any philosopher, he or she, mostly he, uh, will tell you that it's immoral to treat different points in time differently just because they're different points in time. The implication of this is immediately that you treat people who are born at different times would also be treated differently, which goes against everything we stand for, right? People are equal and should be treated equally. But if somebody is born in the year 2050, should she be treated differently than somebody who was born in 1950? No, not just because there's a century between them, right? So all religious teachings, all our ethical and philosophical guidance tells us that we should not discount the future. At the same time, if you look at how people behave, if you look at whether people are impatient and whether people want the good things now or later, they always say, give it to me now. If you ask somebody, when do you want to see the next season of Stranger Things? They will tell you, I want to see it tonight. I don't want to wait. I think it's another year that we have to wait until it comes out. We don't want that, right? So that then for public policy creates a conundrum, right? Because does the government have the right to say, well, based on moral principles, I'm going to override the will of the people. Everybody is impatient. But as a government, I'm going to ignore this advice and use a very low discount rate. Or do you say, no, the government should reflect the will of the people? And there is no, no good answer to this. We actually have, in many walks of life, we totally accept that the government is there to prevent us from doing bad things, right? That we know that in many ways, the way the government is supposed to behave is also that it constrains us from our bad instincts. So in that sense, yeah, the government has a right and we actually elect people to make these decisions for us because we know we can't trust ourselves. So that is an argument that government democracy is not mob rule, right? But at the same time, do we want a government that is strongly moralizing and strongly paternalistic and just says, well, I don't care what the population thinks, <laughs> I override them. There's no, no clean answer to this. And then recent developments, on the developments of the last two decades or so in economics and psychology have shown that the way people discount the future is way more complicated than we used to think. There's all sorts of cognitive and behavioral biases in there that makes the simple formula that Samuelson wrote down way back when believe in 1937, just doesn't hold anymore. And there's hyperbolic discounting, that is, people treat the difference. If you use the standard form of discounting, then the difference between 10 years from now and 11 years from now is the same as the difference between 100 years from now and 101 years from now. 
that is what exponential geometric discounting does, but we don't think that way. We think that the difference between 10 years from now and 11 years from now is roughly the same as 100 years from now and 110 years from now. That this is relative time rather than absolute time. Well, there's all sorts of behavioral uh, stuff that is going on there that makes it actually very, very difficult to measure how people discount the future, let alone how to aggregate that then to society. Unfortunately, a problem like climate change, we have to somehow do this, right? Right. And that's where policy comes in and <laughs> where climate economics starts to translate into policy decisions is unsurprisingly complex and controversial. So I noted earlier that damage estimates are relatively simple in the sense that they can be time independent and discounting doesn't play a role. But policymakers want to know, well, what do I do now? And concerned citizens may want to know, what do I do now? And those damage estimates can be expressed with more information, perhaps more usefulness as social cost of carbon. And that must take into account discounting. Can you say a little bit about what the social cost of carbon is and why it is an even more contested figure than the damage of a given amount of climate change? So the social cost of carbon is the damage done by emitting one additional ton of CO2 or the damage avoided by reducing your emissions by one ton. That is the definition of the social cost of carbon. The reason that we're interested in this is technically, if you want to find an optimal emission trajectory, then you need to write down the first order conditions and the first order conditions always involve marginals. And social cost of carbon is essentially the marginal impact. Intuitively, it's much more prosaic than that as a single individual or even as the leader of a mid-sized country, or even a large country for between two elections, you cannot hope to take away all of climate change. The best you can hope to do is that you take away a small part of climate change. So we should re really be looking at small incremental damages rather than the sum total of impacts of climate change. So that is the social cost of carbon. The way to calculate the social cost of carbon is essentially you run a scenario with emissions and concentrations and temperature change and rainfall change, and then you calculate the impacts along that scenario. Uh, and then you calculate a second scenario where you have ever, you have slightly more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. You calculate the new concentrations, new climate change, new impacts. You take the difference between the two, and then you use a discount rate to bring it all back to the point of emission. That is essentially what you do. And there's three aggregations going on there. There is sort of you have to sum up these impacts or these incremental impacts over time. You also have to add them up over space. And we talked a little bit about that. These impacts fall on very different people, and you need to aggregate across people. Uh, but of course, everything is also dramatically uncertain. Everything is uncertain if you look into the future, but our understanding of many of the processes and our understanding of future emissions and so on and so forth is imperfect. And therefore, you also need to somehow aggregate over all the possibilities that you have there. So one of the assumptions that you make in calculating social cost of carbon is those total impacts, those total economic impacts that we talked about before. But you need to also make assumptions about future emissions. You need to make assumptions of how uh, CO2 ac accumulates in the atmosphere, how the climate responds. You need to make assumptions about where those impacts are going to fall how rich those people will be, how many people there will be, and so on and so forth. And that introduces a large number of additional degrees of freedom in the calculations. And it also introduces these aggregation problems that you need to discount to today. You need to account for the income differences and the impact differences between people. But you also somehow need to aggregate across these scenarios. And if things are 5% better than your best guess, does that cancel against things being 5% worse? How do you do that? So that introduces another controversial assumption that you need to make. And that estimates of the social cost of carbon actually show a much wider range than published estimates of the total impact of climate change. Uh, we're talking about several orders of magnitude there. An economist would certainly look at policymaking as maximizing net benefits, and that requires consideration of both benefits and costs. 
we've been talking a lot about the costs of climate change and the benefits of avoiding it. But acting to avoid climate change also carries costs as well as co-benefits. How do climate economists think about the costs of cutting emissions? As this is something that I see less chatter about. That is interesting, actually, because the I mean estimates of the impacts of climate change are hugely controversial and very uncertain. If you look at estimates of the impacts of climate policy, they're actually also very uncertain. But for some reason, this has not captured the public debate, the public imagination at all. The, the experts behind closed doors are actually at each other's throats. So the way you do these estimates is actually fairly straightforward. If you want to reduce CO2 emissions from power generation, then essentially what you need to do is you need to replace coal and gas by wind and solar. And that brings, or that used to bring, and no longer the case, that brings an additional cost to power generation. And that is a fairly simple calculation. But of course, if the price of electricity goes up, then the price of everything that uses electricity, which is everything, goes up as well. Uh, so you need to calculate how that trickles through the economy. But basically, the, the calculation there is fairly straightforward. The controversies in this literature come from essentially two sources. One is disagreement about how fast the economy responds to price changes. And that is essentially an empirical problem. We simply do not have the data and fine enough detail in the data and long enough time series to parameters accurately. So people just disagree on how to calibrate their models is essentially a big source of uncertainty there. Another thing that people disagree about, and this is an irreducible uncertainty, is that we're not so much interested in what climate policy would do to today's economy for which we actually don't know much about today's economy, but we know a lot about the economy of two years ago, right? Because that's the delay in that data become available. But really, we are interested in what climate policy will do to the economy 10 years from now. So we're comparing one hypothetical economy in 2030 to another hypothetical economy in 2030. And essentially, the solution to reducing emissions is to change technologies to swap one fuel for another fuel, essentially. And that the cost for that depends on what do you expect the relative prices of these things to be, right? And uh, we're not very good, unfortunately, at forecasting energy prices. So that is another big source of disagreement between models. And then there's uh, also the question of how fast do these new technologies come online? And how credible is it that these new technologies come online? And we can talk, for instance, about nuclear, because nuclear, it's actually, as academics, it is very hard to gauge the true cost of nuclear because it's mostly commercial secrets. So we don't really know what nuclear power really costs. So that is a problem now. And some people assume that nuclear is cheap. Other people uh, include the liabilities and the transport of nuclear waste and all that sort of stuff. And then nuclear becomes much more expensive. So reasonable people reasonably disagree about the cost of this technology. And then there's also the question, the, the social and the political question of how fast you can expand nuclear power. And for a very long time in Europe, and it's still ongoing uh, in North America, even though there may have been or there may be an economic case for building additional nuclear society will simply not allow it. And we've seen that in Germany recently, the perfectly good nuclear power plants were shut down in the middle of an energy crisis for political reasons, right? So the availability of technology, not just in the technical sense, but also in the political and social sense, usually determines what is going on in the energy sector and therefore how easy or how hard it is to reduce emissions. And all that makes that if you look across the very many models that have estimated the cost of climate policy, you see often two orders of magnitude difference between the cheapest and the most expensive model. But this does not capture the public imagination and people do not talk about this much. So speaking of technologies, 
I wanted to bring up a couple that are now being discussed as climate policy options. So carbon dioxide removal first is now quite integrated into our visions of the climate future. Does that technology change the fundamental economic picture or not? Absolutely. I mean, direct air capture, carbon capture and storage essentially are our only ways of meeting the agreements, the targets of the Paris Agreement of 2015. It's simply politically not feasible to cut emissions fast enough to meet those targets. So we need to start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere in one way or another. Basically, all models agree on that. You can't get there without large-scale carbon capture. These technologies are now proven technologies, right? Carbon capture has been, from flue gases, has been a proven uh, technology for a long time now, for a couple of decades. Direct air capture has been a proven technology for one or two years. I'm not following it that closely, but something like that. It's still fairly costly, but it can be done. The main problem there, in my mind, is not so much technology, but the social and the political feasibility. There is, at the moment, uh, the market for CO2 is saturated. There are enough bubbles in our beer. We don't need any more. So the only reason that you would want to capture CO2 is for climate policy. This is not a product that has any commercial application at the moment. That may change, but I haven't seen any good promise there. So the only reason you want to do this is because somebody either gives you a subsidy directly that the government pays you to do this, or you earn an offset and you sell it on a carbon permit market. Those are the only reasons why you would want to capture CO2 at scale. Now, look at the models that are in the latest, latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and you look at the explicit or implicit carbon prices that they have, and you look at the quantities of CO2 that they suck out of the atmosphere. And essentially, if you have a carbon tax on emissions, then that automatically translates into a carbon subsidy for CO2 removal, right? And you can just calculate the money that would be spent on that. Now, in some of the more optimistic models, that is 1% of GDP. And then we can shrug our shoulders and say, well, tidy sum of money, but we're not going to lose sleep over that. But in other models, that actually goes up to 20 and sometimes 40% of GDP. And the idea that we would be spending so much money on sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere strikes me as just not credible, right? I mean, we spend at the moment uh, worldwide around 10% of our income on healthcare. And most of us probably think that it's investment in one way or another, because we all have relatives who need this. And we all know people work in healthcare and who we think deserve a good income. So that is money we think is well spent. But that, that is not how carbon capture will work, right? This will be large-scale monoplantations in faraway places where the land is cheap, right? Heavily mechanized to keep the cost down. So it will not employ many people, and those subsidies will go to large multinationals. And the idea that we're going to give 5% tax revenue or 20% of tax revenue to large multinationals to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere somewhere in Africa or somewhere in Brazil, no, <laughs> I just can't see that. I can't see any politician stand on a platform and say, this is what we're going to do. Please vote for me. I guess, I guess a thought there as well is these are scenarios that are sort of the cost efficient way to meet 2100 temperature targets set in 2015. But the costs are going to be paid in the 2080s. Would it make economic sense for the 2080s to spend all that money to meet 2015 climate targets? <laughs> no, I don't think so. That is something that we have seen repeatedly in international climate policy as well as national climate policy. Politicians essentially promise that their successors, successors are going to do things, that in two or three elections time, we're going to meet these targets, and that's where the real cost will be. And what we've seen, and I've been following climate policy for a while now, the first emission reduction targets were formulated in 1988. And every time you sort of come up to actually meeting those targets, they were replaced by a later target. And the original target was silently ditched. And we've seen that play out ever since the late 80s. And I think the same thing will happen again. No, the people in 2050 will not be happy with the promises that we made uh, in 2023.
So another technology Jesse and I focus on and is now beginning to come in from the periphery of the climate discussion is solar radiation management or solar geoengineering. Now, in my understanding of the literature on this, it's much more disruptive to the economic models and predictions in that it's very cheap to do, it deals with temperature. And so in the models, you solve for keeping temperature below your target by substituting for the most part emissions cuts by solar radiation management. What are your thoughts on this? Is this a cheap fix for the climate problem or are our economic models not the appropriate tool for analyzing it? It was Scott Barrett, right? Who simply, he called it incredulous or incredible, I can't, I can't recall. If you stick this in a standard economic model with sort of your standard, because I mean, essentially you can take problem away in the order of magnitude, tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Rather than the billions and trillions that we're talking about climate policy. So solar radiation management is incredibly cheap. There's all sorts of technical climatological issues there, right? You can control the temperature, but perhaps not rainfall and so on and so forth. It's all usually uncertain. I mean, we have trouble understanding the climate as it is. If we introduce an intervention like this, do we actually know what we're doing? So there's all sorts of issues there. Uh, the main issue, I believe, has to do with control. Who is in charge of this? And that is perhaps most profound if we're not talking about putting sulfur in the atmosphere, but we're talking about putting mirrors uh, in space, right, to reflect sunlight. Then the question really becomes who is in control? If Joe Biden is in control, then we probably think, well, he's a nice man after all. Not everybody agrees. But if Trump gets reelected, then we start to worry, right? And other people with different political inclinations would think of this the other way around. But Xi Jinping could also be in control, right? And then we would be not so impressed. China also has the technical uh, wherewithal to do such a thing. And the same is true, but at a smaller scale, uh, if you start injecting uh, sulfur into the atmosphere or other particles. Uh, my understanding is that you can't contain this over a country, but you would do it over an entire uh, latitudinal band. So if China does this at a large scale, then you immediately affect the climate in Europe and North America as well. Or if the Maldives want to do this, then they start also affecting climate of Indonesia, right? So you have all these issues of governance. Who makes these decisions? How do we stop people from making decisions that we do not like? That makes this really tricky. Of course, we can well expect that there are countries that will do this. Things like that, and not just weather modification, but climate modification at scale. And it completely changes uh, the economics, uh, but it also completely changes the politics of this. And at the moment, we don't have a good answer how to control this and how to manage this. I want to shift gears a bit for a couple of final substantive questions about the relationship between climate economists and yourself and the wider climate change policy and science community. So first and most generally, I get the sense that both climate scientists and climate policy experts look somewhat skeptically at climate economists. They see William Nordhaus proposing that, well, when you look at the costs and the benefits at the margin, it looks like the optimal amount of global warming is two and a half degrees Celsius. And I suspect your conclusions are not terribly far from that. Why is this? Are climate economists not the bearers of good news? And, and if so, why, why are they met with such a chilly reception from their colleagues in adjacent fields? Well, you should really ask them that. <laughs> I mean, it's partly because the message is not popular. To environmentalists, climate is the biggest problem. Climate change is the biggest problem of humankind. And then an economist comes along and says, no, I actually can, can give you 10 problems that are bigger than this, right? And that is just not a popular uh, message. Economists, of course, are also just obnoxious people, right? Economics as a discipline is very elitist. And the people who make it to the top and the people who speak on behalf of the discipline are arrogant and make arguments that are very technical and people don't understand and then are easily dismissed. So it, it's partly the way we bring mess messages is perhaps not the best. I'm talking about Nordhaus. Yeah, he is a professor at Yale, a Nobel laureate. You don't argue with him. At least that is the impression that he creates. 
actually, Bill likes to argue with people, but he only argues with smart people, right? You need to be at his level to argue with him. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> economists are not the easiest to work with uh, because of this. And of course, the incentive structure of the discipline is also such that we are not encouraged to speak with others. We are encouraged to impress our peers, not uh, the outside world. Economists have, throughout the history of the discipline, always done public policy and always done policy advice. But always, at the same time, the general attitude in the discipline is one that policymakers cannot be trusted and do not understand. So the way we teach young economists is also to perhaps look down on policymakers. So the way we communicate is perhaps <laughs> invites uh, the skepticism. And it's not just that sort of Bill Nordhaus's methods that we should reduce emissions, but perhaps not by as much as everybody else uh, seems to think. That is not a popular message. Uh, but also in terms of how policy or how emissions should be reduced and how policy should be designed, economists go around and say, no, what we want is uni a uniform carbon price, right? All emissions are the same. All emissions should be treated the same. We should have a tradable permits that includes everything, or we should have a carbon tax and that's it. And then we can go home. That is, of course, not a message that is popular with a politician who wants to sort of reward his allies because there is very little scope for corruption or rent seeking there. It is not a message that is popular with a civil servant who wants to come up with a complicated subsidy scheme so that he can employ 10 people to monitor this scheme, right? It is not a popular thing that economists say. As I said, economists also sometimes take pride in this. I have a history of working with environmental scientists as well as with economists. And if I say to my environmental science friends that this politician was cross with me or this civil servant was cross with me, they're all concerned, right? And they think I should make up the men bridges and stuff. Whereas if I say this to my senior economist friends, they say, yeah. Good for you. They hate you. You probably told them the right thing. So the atmosphere is just very different between the disciplines. The second aspect of potential, or in this case, parent disagreement, is more specific to you. And that's that you've been fairly critical of the IPCC. And I know you were involved in at least assessment report five, the fifth one, maybe before that as well. And if my internet research tells me the truth, you, in fact, stepped down from your work with the IPCC during the development of the Summary for Policymakers of Working Group 2 in Assessment Report 5. Sorry for all the technical jargon there, but it's a critical stage of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change producing its recommendations. This would be back in 2014, if my memory is right. No need to get into that specific case, but, but more generally, what's wrong with the IPCC? Why are you critical of it? Has it outlived its usefulness? I want to go into the specific case first. So essentially what happened was I've actually been involved in the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. And I think it's a good organization. It does useful things. And what happens with the summary for policymakers is that the first draft, I thought we had the right message. And that is that the impacts of climate change or the most severe impacts of climate change are to a large extent symptoms of underdevelopment and mismanagement. That was what the first draft said. And then the next draft was all the standard doom and gloom. Uh, we're all going to die type of uh, stories about the impacts of climate change. Um, so I said, well, anybody who knows me in my position knows that I cannot be an author of this, right? I cannot have written this, so I quietly withdrew my name. And then months later, I had a conversation like this with a journalist for an hour about something else. And then at the very end, slipped in that I had stepped down from the summary for policymakers. And that was then world news the day after, right? Uh, so that is what happened. I never intended to get this out. It was an accident, but no excuse, right? I'm experienced enough to know what journalists are like. So I should just have kept my mouth shut, but I didn't. Now, what is wrong with the IPCC? The main problem with the IPCC is that it's so conservative. The IPCC was set up also in 1988 with a particular goal and with a particular structure, 
And people who worked on the first assessment report would recognize the fifth and the sixth assessment report, how it's done, how it's written, how it's structured. Nothing much has changed. Climate policy has completely changed. Climate science has progressed quite a lot, but the IPCC hasn't. It's still, let's write a big report in secret and create a big media splash every six years. That just doesn't sit with the way that the, the, the current news cycle at all. It also doesn't work for climate science because there are some fields, climate science, that actually haven't moved in 20 years and still are sort of asked to write down the same thing over and over again every five years. God, how boring. And whereas other parts of the science move much faster and the IPCC is outdated before it's published uh, because they go through this very slow publishing process. So just don't think that it is of the times anymore. The structural problem is that the IPCC doesn't have a reason to change. It's a monopoly. And it's a monopoly for good reasons, because it's very expensive to set this up. So an economist would call this a natural monopoly. And you see, indeed, that it's doing some of the things that economic theory predicts monopolies do. So lack of, the, of innovation, rent capture, right? There are people who are professionally IPCCers. That's the only thing they do. And that is how they build their reputation. That is how they build their career. And really, the IPCC should invite the best people, right? Not just the convenient sample of people who volunteer and people we know, not just the old boys and old girls network. So those are things that I think the IPCC should do differently. But of course, they are all the, the people who make the decisions are all insiders and they have absolutely no reason to do so. The thing that worries me perhaps most for the next IPCC round is relationship with policy. And the IPCC very much serves the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we don't know when the next IPCC report will be, but let's say it's around 2029, something like that. The latest forecast from the Hadley Center is that we will have breached one and a half degrees by then. And the IPCC in the previous report or in the current report, it still maintains the illusion that we can meet one and a half degrees. The IPCC will have to turn around and say, sorry, policymakers, but really you should never have promised this. And really, it needs to turn around and stand up to policymakers and start saying, well, you have promised to cut emissions since 1988, but never succeeded. These, these are the reasons why emissions haven't fallen, right? And this is why we have now breached uh, the lower limit Paris Agreement. And the IPCC will need to take a much more, more direct criticism of policy and all the policy failures in the past. And given the personnel in the IPCC and given the way it interprets its mandate and given the way the plenary is structured and given the way people are elected to the IPCC Bureau, I just don't see the IPCC do this. It's just like so not IPCC to turn around to policymakers and say, no, you did this wrong and you did that wrong and you should have done better. And of course, that is how I would say it. But it couched in polite terms. I still don't see how they can do that. And that will be the, I think, the biggest challenge for the next round in the IPCC. Well, we like to end on an optimistic note. So what gives you hope for the future? Two things. One is, and I've said this a couple of times now, I've been doing this for 30 years now. If I think back on how we thought about the greenhouse gas emission reduction 30 years ago and what we know now, it is easier than we thought then. Solar power, wind power, batteries, hydrogen, uh, electrification of transport, electrification of heating have all progressed fa faster than definitely I thought possible. So that is good. And there's no reason why the rate of progress should slow down there. So that, I think, is a good thing. The other thing that we have seen is that some of the problems that we worried about, some of the impacts of climate change that we worried about are going away. It used to be in the mid-1990s that we were all terribly concerned about malaria and what climate change would do to malaria. And the biology and the ecology and the climatology are still the same. You would expect an increase in the potential of malaria in a warmer and wetter future. But the rollout of bed nets, the reintroduction of DDT, the development of a malaria vaccine, and so on and so forth, has actually made that this problem is going away. Also, if you look at one of the poster children of vulnerability to climate change, Bangladesh, 
Actually, Bangladesh has been making remarkable economic progress. The, the politics are much more stable than they used to be. They're still nasty, they're still autocratic, but they're now stable. There's no reason for politicians to steal as much money as quickly as they can anymore. They now have time to actually sit down and do some good for the country occasionally. Also, if you look at the Maldives, the rate of progress there, Maldives was, of course, one of those island states that would completely disappear. They are now masters at coastal engineering that we did not think possible 30 years ago. So I think there has been remarkable progress in greenhouse gas emission reduction, remarkable relative to my expectations 20, 30 years ago. But we've also seen good progress in reducing vulnerability to climate change. So that keeps me relatively optimistic. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Richard. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere, and consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challengingclimate.